Test, testing, test, testing, one, two. Good afternoon, everyone. Thanks for joining us for this SD Inbound webinar and spending the next half hour or so with us. We really think you know you're gonna you're gonna gain some great insight and some some really cool tools that you can take with you. We're really excited to introduce uh, you know this new webinar series called Live in SD. We're gonna be doing one of these every single corner. And each one is going to feature a different specialist focusing on a different topic. My name's Nick. I'm a marketing technologist here at Campaign Creators. And uh, I'm Sean, and I lead the campaign team here at Campaign Creators. Yeah, and we're really proud to be hosting this webinar series for SD Inbound. In this particular webinar, we're, we're going to be walking through an inbound marketing campaign. It's pretty cool. But before we jump into the slides, uh, we just want to make every make sure everyone has the best experience possible. So in order to do that, make sure you're viewing on the highest quality setting. If you're not, some of the slides might be too pixelated to read, and obviously we don't want you missing out on anything. So click the gear icon in the bottom right corner of your screen, and then scroll up and select the highest quality, and that should do it. Another thing, we want this to be as interactive as possible. So if you have any questions whatsoever during the webinar, just submit them, submit them into the chat. And uh, our coworker, Tammy, it will be quick to answer them right on the spot. And then the, the questions that we deem the best of the best, uh, we're, we'll make sure to address them in a little mini Q&A session at the end. But uh, yeah, for now, let's get started and, and jump into the deck. All right, let's, let's get going. So, so we start sharing the screen here. All right, so off to the races we go. So I know the first question that a lot of you are going to be asking yourselves is, why are you here? Uh, so there's kind of four main things that we'd like you to take away from today's workshop webinar. The first is to learn about cutting edge strategies to both analyze and push your campaign to the next level. The second is we're going to give you a great organizational tool, namely the campaign optimization checklist. Uh, and this is for identifying the pieces of your campaign that actually need optimization. Third, we're going to see a case example of a, of a real world campaign in the context of optimization. And then finally, as, as kind of a thank you to you guys, we're going to give you early access to this exclusive practical handbook of, of proven optimization tips. Uh, we expect to be ready about two weeks from now. Uh, and we're going to go ahead and send that over to you guys as soon as it's ready. So just to kind of put things in perspective here, you can see the checklist on the left. 
uh, which will be delivered to you directly after the webinar, and then the handbook on the right, which will come out about two weeks from today. So the first thing I want to do is get aligned on, on what a campaign is. Uh, so we like to use this definition. A, a campaign is a multi-touch digital ecosystem aligned with a buyer's journey that helps marketers capture lead information, nurture and qualify leads, and finally empowers both the lead and the salesperson for a sales conversation. So I know a lot, what a lot of you are thinking is what the heck did I just say? It's, it's a little bit of a mouthful, but let's go into a little bit more detail here to, to get, make sure we get a good understanding. So a lot of times clients will come, come to me and say, you know, I have a website, I'm doing some SEO, I'm doing some email nurturing, uh, but how do they all fit? How does, it, how does it tie together? So we like to use this inbound ecosystem graphic to kind of show the different pieces and how they tie together uh, and how they interact with each other. So essentially when, when we talk about a campaign, we like to think of it in the context of a, of a digital ecosystem. To kind of go the opposite direction, I'd, I'd like to give you a quick example of what a campaign is not. A lot of people think that driving awareness to a landing page and then having somebody fill out that form on the landing page constitutes a campaign. Uh, we, we might disagree with that. And the reason being is there's, there's a lot more pieces and I'm gonna walk you through kind of a blown out version of what that campaign looks like uh, and take one piece at a time. So these are initially the, the different awareness channels and this list could be 40, 50 long if you really like it to and you really wanna cater these channels based upon your target persona. So after you have these different, different channel and awareness channels, what you're trying to do is then initially drive them to a landing page, more specifically a top of the funnel landing page. And then as they engage with that landing page, maybe they convert, maybe they don't, but we want to do certain activities, namely email, to be able to work them through the funnel as, as quickly and as efficiently as possible so that they can come out the other end and be more educated and be more aligned. Now, naturally, people are going to drop off at certain points in your funnel. It's important then to try and re-engage them using tactics like list segmentation, using things like retargeting to try and bring them back into your digital ecosystem that you create. Now, one thing I think that's worth mentioning here is there's a lot of talk about sales enablement. How do you get that marketing, those sales teams communicating with each other and kind of shaking hands? Well, the way you do that is through an SLA, a service level agreement, and you get everybody on the same page saying, this is what constitutes an MQL or a marketing qualified lead. This is what constitutes an SQL or a sales qualified lead. And then really being able to go through those and making sure that everybody's aligned and on the same page. Now, finally, I think, and we'll get into a little bit more detail about this later, but another point is that as you, as you try and re-engage these people and as you gather information about them, you want to be able to cater offerings towards what they're saying they're interested in. So maybe you drop them, depending on how they're engaging with their campaign or, or the information that you're giving you, into a completely different landing page or a completely different campaign so that hopefully you can re-engage them and, and give them what they're really looking for and try and provide as much value and education as possible. Cool. So just off of that, I want to address one question that a lot of us think of, uh, is, and, and that is why should we optimize our campaigns? I think one, one reason is pretty clear after Sean just did that run through is that these campaigns are really, really complicated. They can be very sophisticated. They have a lot of different moving pieces. And obviously it's very important to dig a little bit deeper and find which parts are performing well, which ones aren't. That's pretty simple. But we also have another mentality, kind of a bit of like an ethos to hold true to. And I really like this quote, there is always space for improvement, no matter how long you've been in the business. And it comes from Oscar De La Hoya, obviously a, you know, a champion boxer. And I think it really encapsulates what, what we're kind of trying to achieve with optimization. Basically saying that even if we're meeting our benchmarks or we're outperforming our benchmarks, there's always room for improvement, good is not necessarily good enough. And uh, you know, we're always looking to grow. We're always looking to outdo ourselves. And we, you know, we have this mentality when we go into client meetings and we expect clients that you know come on board with us to have that same mentality and want to grow with us. So that's a little bit of our, our background thinking behind, uh, behind optimizing. Good stuff. Another question that we get a lot of times is, is when to optimize, right? How do I know when my campaign needs to be optimized? And, and what that really starts with is, is the benchmarks. Uh, so when, when you establish those benchmarks, essentially you're giving yourself something to shoot for and, and a goal. So there's, there's a few different ways to establish those benchmarks. 
Uh, the first one in the most preferred way is through your company's historical campaign data. What better to compare your company to than your own than to your own company? So if you have historical campaign data related to your emails, related to your landing pages, that really is the, the best the best option. As, as another option, you can look at your closest competitors' data. Now, a lot of us hold our data very closely, and it's sometimes very hard to gather this data. But there's a lot of tools out there these days. You know, one that comes to mind is, is SpyFu that allows you to kind of gather data based upon how your competitors' search engine optimization activities are going or their pay-per-click activities. So another really good thing to look at is, is your closest competitors' data if you have that available. Uh, the, the third way, and it's not my favorite, and I think this is talked about quite a bit, is an industry standard. But as we know, every company is different, every target persona is different, and every industry is different. So industry standards, to me, if it's the best you got, it's the best you got, and go ahead and run with it, but not necessarily the preferred method of, of, of going about it. And finally, the fourth one is, is your best guesstimate. Um, this is kind of a last resort, but if, as long as you use that heuristic framework and being able to make an educated guess as best as possible, you know, there's not, there's not major issues with doing that. So I think another side of this is, is how do you establish your goals or your KPIs? So initially, goals are something that, that you try and shoot for and try and achieve with goal setting. Uh, a lot of people will use that SMART framework, right? Uh, I'm not going to get into too much detail about that, but basically it goes into specific, measurable, attainable, relevant, and time-bound. Uh, and those really relate to the KPIs or key performance indicators, which we'll get into a, a bit later. Uh, in front of you now, you should see this, this chi-squared formula, and this is really important when it comes to the question when to optimize and when do I have enough data to optimize. So if, if stats isn't really your thing, uh, we're, we're sharing with you guys a quick tool that allows you not to do the nitty-gritty math behind this, uh, but we like to use the chi-squared goodness of fit formula for basically being able to determine is, is, is it important to optimize now and do we have enough data to constitute optimization? So I think that's an important one we'll touch on a bit later. Uh, moving forward, I think another question we get is, is what do you need to optimize? And, and uh, there's a lot of talk about this in the space recently, uh, something called a marketing technology stack. This is one representation of a marketing technology stack that we like to use internally. There's a lot of different ways to do this, uh, so it's not the end all be all by any means. But when you, when you start to use a bunch of different tools in, in the context of a campaign, it can get very complicated very fast. So the one thing I always tell people to focus on to not get overwhelmed with, with tools is to be very metric focused, right? As long as you focus on your specific metrics that you're trying to measure and you're trying to perform and, and optimize, uh, you know, you can, you can really focus on the most important tools uh, to use and then documenting it in something like a marketing technology stack. So what it really helps to do in addition to just documentation is it helps people to, to visualize what your marketing technology stack looks like. It helps to align the different team members as far as the platforms that you're using. And then even as you bring on new team members, it's great to have a resource or a poster on the wall to say, hey, go check out our marketing technology stack. Um, and you might be able to gather some, some quick insight as to why we're using the tools if you, if you look at that. So uh, let's get into a little bit more of the specifics now. I talk about the platforms used for this particular analysis. I'm sure you guys are familiar with a lot of these logos. HubSpot, great marketing automation, uh, Backbone, uh, Google Analytics, ever important, right? You should be using it. Uh, you definitely should be using a lot of these main social media platforms as well. Google AdWords, probably the most longstanding uh, paid ad platform on the market. Uh, Hotjar. Super important. We'll get into some of the cool, cool, uh, I guess cases within Hotjar here a bit later, but basically related to, to heat mapping and, and user recordings and everything else. And then Zapier, a really powerful uh, integration tool that allows you to kind of circumvent developers and not have to go and, and build out these APIs, uh, but to do so in a little bit more of a turnkey format, which we'll touch on and get get a bit later. So let's uh, let's jump into it, Nick. Yeah. What do you let's, think? Yeah, let's do it. So uh, yeah, uh, like Sean mentioned before. We did a, a case study analysis and optimization for, especially just for this, uh, just for this webinar, and uh, so we put together a campaign, ran it for for two weeks time, uh, did a bunch of analysis, and then in, uh, integrated some of our optimization strategies to see if we can improve its results. So the the campaign that we chose is called Introduction to Lead Generation. It's a it's a High level look at inbound marketing. The first asset is is shares the same name, intro to lead gen. And it's basically targeting someone that might be interested in, in inbound marketing or have heard of, heard of it before, but doesn't necessarily know too much about it. And that's kind of the, the target persona that we're going after. 
And just to give you guys a little clearer look, here's a breakdown of, of the different pieces of the campaign. We had two pieces of premium content uh, or guides. We had one free assessment consultation. All three of these things were housed on a landing page. We also had two thank you pages to deliver those, those two uh, pieces of premium content that I mentioned at the beginning. We also sent out three emails, three blast emails to our user database to let them know that the campaign existed. On top of that, six nurture emails in between the different stages, like Sean mentioned, to, to nurture people along the way through the funnel. We had five different workflows housing those, those nine emails. And uh, five plus, I, I put a, a question mark here, uh, segmentation lists uh, to power those workflows, and that included people filling out the forms, people active in different workflows, and, and, that, and I put that question mark just because that number could continue to grow. On top of that, we also put a pretty modest uh, paid ad budget just on Facebook ads, $200 over the course of the two weeks to just kind of generate those results. On top of that, we also had four social media posts across all of our different channels and also miscellaneous, just one website pop-up on all of our relevant web pages. And just to give you guys a little bit of context, I'm going to run you through the, the three landing pages that I mentioned just so you can see what it looks like. This is that first page. Obviously, you can see that first asset, a little information about it, a nice banner, some more information, some testimonials and trust logos at the bottom. Obviously, got our form. We fill out the form. We hit download now. We're redirected to the to the next page where the next asset is housed. A little bit more involving asset. We call it next level lead gen. Similar structure here. A little bit more involving questions. We fill out that form, and we're redirected to that consultation or assessment free marketing assessment page uh, that I that I mentioned before. So that just kind of shows you what the campaign looked like. So the next step, naturally, was to dissect this campaign and figure out the pieces that were performing well, the pieces that weren't performing well, and base our optimization process off of that. And how do you do this? One way that we can recommend is using our free campaign optimization checklist. And I'm going to show you guys what that looks like. So it's basically a tried and true way to kind of break up your campaign into its different parts. You've got your different uh, areas, you know, emails, landing pages, paid ads, social media, blog, and then a miscellaneous section in case we missed any of your channels. The way it works, basically you've got your KPIs, the key KPIs of each area, a formula to calculate those KPIs, an example of a, a calculation for that KPI, and then a space to put your results and compare it to your benchmark. And finally, a little check checkbox at the end to determine you know, if, you're, if you're meeting your benchmark or outperforming it uh, and to check whether or not it sucks or not. And then finally, at the bottom, we put in a little section, uh, I really need to optimize my, and then a space to put the KPIs that you really, really need to focus on. Uh, and yeah, and and go from there. And you know, there's a lot of different ways to do this. Uh, just want to mention also, yeah, that asset is going to be available at the end of the webinar, so stay tuned for that. Um, but you know, there's a lot of ways, different ways to to fill it out. You can fill it out as you like. We prefer to print it out. This is how we fared. Um, you know, put pen to paper and and saw how we did it. Um, and then once we came up with the results at the end, we went through a prioritize prior prioritization process uh, using uh, pie analysis, and, and Sean's going to run through that real quick. Yeah, so the, the, the pie analysis is, is borrowed a bit from the conversion rate optimization world, and for those of you familiar with that, those doing CRO, uh, but a lot of times Nick and I will sit down after a campaign is run for X amount of time and say, all right, well, how do how we perform? And how we perform, then there's organizing and, and prioritizing those different elements. So. This is a quick framework that we like to use. It focuses on three specific parts. Uh, one, potential, which is what is the potential positive impact on the campaign results. Uh, secondly, the importance. How critical is it to your overall business objectives? And three is the ease. How difficult is the task to complete? Right. So a lot of people might look at one of these variables specifically, but we like to kind of take a weighted average of all three. And I'm going to quickly share with you guys on the next slide the pie analysis that we did for this. So looking at these, right, assigning numbers on a, on a scale from 0 to 10 for each of the potential importance and ease criteria 
So, you know, for the email, you see the three in that potential category. Uh, so it doesn't have really a lot of potential. Um, if, if, it, if it did, we would probably be something closer to 10. And then we take the weighted average of those three items uh, for the PI score. And you can see here that if we were, you know, focusing on, on what to do first, we would probably take that tofu landing page and start to try and optimize that as best as possible. Cool. Yeah, lots of numbers. So based based on that PI analysis, these are the, the things that we decided to focus on most. For email, click-through rate. For the landing page, the form submission rate. For the paid ads, cost per lead, really needed to improve that. And, and for social media, the click-through rate. So let's jump into the optimization. And uh, we, we, we organized our process nice and neat for you guys. Uh, picked out a particular piece did some analysis using uh, various tools that, that we uh, laid out earlier in the, in the webinar. Used the checklists and the pie, pie analysis to find out a, a focus point. And then uh, went to, you know, to our trusty uh, campaign optimization handbook to find a, a strategy that worked best for, for this particular piece and, and boost performance. And, hey, hey yeah. Nick, Nick I, got a, I got a quick question for you. So looking at the, at the focus points, right, and you run that analysis and say in the context of, of email, which we're looking at currently, um, what happens if you have multiple focus points, if you have multiple KPIs that you're, that you're trying to optimize for? How do you know what to do? Do you do them simultaneously? How does that, how does that really work? Yeah, I, I think in, the, in these situations, it, you know, isolation is, is so important to not muddle data. You know, it's really, it's really difficult to attribute the success of one particular optimization tactic, for example, testing more hyperlinks, which we have written here, um, you know, to attribute it to a single metric when you're, when you're using multiple different elements. So for that reason, it's, you know, it's so important to just isolate everything um, and, and not muddle that data. Does that make sense? Yeah, it makes sense to me. Cool. Um, so yeah, just moving into to email for this particular piece of, of the campaign, we just selected one, uh, the, the MoFu Nurture Email 3. We did some analysis using uh, the HubSpot email tool. I'll show it to you guys real quick. You can focus in on just one campaign, uh, designate your timeline, scroll through and see a bunch of analysis, and then all of your list, your emails listed below. So we used that. From that, uh, we, we figured out our focus point was uh, the, the click-through rate. That's the thing that we needed to improve most. Um, and then using that handbook, we decided to test using more hyperlinks uh, to improve that click-through rate and test it going forward. And just to show you what we mean by that, really simple. This is the, 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 the before version of the email. We felt there was a, lot of, a little bit too much white space here. Um, and we filled that in with a, a larger uh, hyperlink um, to see if it would boost performance. So just a small change, but like again, like we like we mentioned before, isolating that that variable and isolating the metric and seeing how it affected performance. Moving on to the next one, landing page optimization. We chose it. To, we chose to do it on the tofu landing page, so the first one that they they uh, arrive on in the campaign. We did analysis using HubSpot, obviously. And, and also Hotjar. Um, and we saw that you know, our submission rate was, was a lot lower than it should be. And this was partly, uh, you know, partly due to the, the large percentage of, of mobile users that were reaching our page and not seeing our form. And we reached this kind of conclusion, um, like I said, from, Hot, from HubSpot, but also mainly from Hotjar and taking a look at uh, user recordings. And I'm going to show you one example of, of those recordings and, and, and show you what I mean. So this is someone that arrived at our, our original landing page uh, via mobile. They get to their page, maybe from an ad or, or from a social media post. They're reading a little bit about the asset. You know, might, they might be interested. But it, it really seems like this person doesn't know what to do. And uh, you know they see the image, but they're not seeing the form coming up. You can start seeing they're clicking the the image to see if that's that's going to result in something. They get a little bit frustrated, and and then they left. Um, so we saw this as an as an issue, and for that reason, we decided to test a, a design template change to see if it would uh, affect uh, the the submission rate and make sure that on mobile that form was a little bit higher up. So I'm going to show you a before, and, uh, before and after example. This is that before one. Obviously, the, the form is on the right-hand side. When, when it stacks on mobile, 
it pushes it all the way down to the bottom, like we saw in the hot jar recording. A template to the one that you saw earlier, move the form to the left hand side, put a little bit more emphasis on it, and made sure it was higher up on the on the screen uh, when viewed on mobile. So again, we're going to see how how that affects uh, performance going forward. Next thing we tried, we chose to optimize was paid ads. We're only running Facebook ads, so we selected that one. We did all of our analysis in Facebook Ads Manager. You know, it's a really, really diverse analytics tool. They have every metric uh, imaginable built in there. Just kind of took a look and realized that our cost per lead was just far too high. Um, and, and again, using that handbook, we we decided uh, to test and see how face Facebook lead ads. Um, had an effect on on the the cost per lead, so we ran the same ads. Um, but I'll just show you really quickly how that that looked. This is the first version of the ad. You know, we had a little bit of text, uh, a video, and then when you click the ETA button or anywhere on the ad, it uh, took you to that landing page. Now we have lead lead ad set up. So when you click that download button, it pops up with a internal Facebook form. Gives you a little bit of information about about the asset and allows you to access the content right then and there on Facebook. So it removes a lot of those barriers um, and potentially can have an effect on that cost per lead. So we're again, you know, we don't know anything for sure. So we're going to test it and, and see how it it affects results. Last thing, we did a little bit of social media optimization. We decided to use Twitter as our channel of of choice. Um, and did all of our analysis uh, inside of HubSpot, just using the sources tool. Basically, broke it breaks down your you know your different uh, traffic sources, and in this case, social media. It also shows you their conversion rate and how many contacts you're generating there. So based off of that, we decided that the main thing we had to focus on was the, the click through rate, and we just implemented a small thing. Um, we just wanted to test and and see if uh, using a clear call to action had an effect on that, that metric. So I'll show you a before, uh, before and after example of a tweet. This is the first one, one of the first ones we sent out. Um, as you can see here at the end, we're mentioning the guide, but we're not really giving them a strong call to action, a strong thing that we want them to do. Uh, so we, we revised that a little bit. We made it a little bit clearer. Get this free guide and checklist, uh, and, then, and then the link at the end. So again, we're going to see how it, how it affects uh, performance. Um, cool. So take a look at those results. Uh, next thing we wanted to do was run through a couple of essential an analysis tools that we think that we can definitely recommend and we think that everybody should be using in their, in their optimization process. Um, it definitely helped us in this particular instance. The first one I want to mention is the HubSpot ads add-on. And I know a lot of you guys are, are probably using paid ads for your now, for your awareness, uh, and and this is just a great tool that, that you can use. Um, and it doesn't have all of that you know that diverse kind of uh, stats that, for example, Facebook Ads Manager has. Uh, but one thing it does show you very clearly is the the progression from impressions to clicks, all the way through to leads and to customers. And that's something that no other platform can can really uh, can really provide. So that's that's why it's so essential. Um, another one kind of built into that is the ROI calculator. It's a great little tool. You can input the the average uh, the average value of one of your customers, and then it'll give you a a very accurate uh, ROI calculation for all of the different ads that you're running um, for that particular campaign. So really really cool tool. Another one we wanted to mention a bit earlier, uh, Zapier. Zapier is really, again, a powerful kind of API tool that allows us to integrate things really effectively. I can think of one case example that, that we use in the past, the, Nick. Facebook, the Facebook lead ads. For the yeah. Facebook lead ads. You know, before we got the HubSpot ads add on, uh, the Facebook lead ads weren't necessarily integrating too well with the HubSpot system. Yep. So through Zapier, we were able to do some kind of clever clever trickery and make sure that data was, was syncing nicely into the actual HubSpot. HubSpot platform. So Zapier, again, really, really powerful tool. Um, and, and again, these will, these will all be hyperlinked in the deck. So when we send the deck out to you at the end of the, the webinar, you guys will have access to the locations for all these tools. Uh, next one I wanted to mention, I know I knocked this a bit earlier, and that's the, the HubSpot email benchmarking tool as far as using industry benchmarks. Um, but if you have no other choice, it's a, it's a great place to start. So HubSpot came up with this really cool tool that really focused on, on email open rate 
and allowed you to kind of analyze how your open rate is comparing not only across industry, but to other people in your industry as well. So that's a really powerful tool. Uh, another one I wanted to touch on quickly is the email client analysis, right? So a lot of people will try and optimize their emails for every single platform. That can be a lot of work. Uh, what I would say is find out specifically what platforms your users and your target audiences are using. For instance, if they're using Outlook or if they're using a mobile device, you want to make sure that you're addressing those up front and a little bit more specifically uh, as far as, again, from a prioritization, we don't have all the time in the world. Uh, how do we how do we address which ones we go after first? Yeah, that's really awesome. Yeah, another one I wanted to mention was, uh, and, and I'm sure a lot of you guys are already using lead lists inside of HubSpot, you know, heavy heavy HubSpot users. Uh, but I put in parentheses here, use them right, and it, for a HubSpot smart lead list building. And what I mean by that is really digging in and and uh, finding some of those not so you know well used uh, functions. For example, building lists based on how people are interacting on, uh, with your emails, if they're opening them, if they're clicking them, um, how they're doing it inside of a particular campaign, are they filling out their forms, and then you know, building that base and, and getting that high level view of, of basically who your, your leads are and, and basically using that information to cater information uh, to those, those specific groups. Um, and it's just very, very valuable. Absolutely. Cool. And then on top of that, I also wanted to talk about HubSpot tracking li links, and that's a little bit related back to uh, to uh, advertising, um, Facebook, and, and Google AdWords. It's so crucial to use those tracking links. Uh, and I, I showed that sources tool earlier, and you can really see using those tracking links, you can really see where traffic is coming from, but on top of that, how it's actually performing. You might be getting a lot of clicks from Facebook, but maybe not they're not necessarily converting or they're not turning into customers, so that'll allow you to uh, gain that information to uh, make adjustments going forward and, and, and properly properly optimize. Yeah, just to add on that, it's all, it's all about clean data. You talk about the kind of where the industry is going, going towards that big data analysis. Uh, those tracking links help you to keep all that data clean so you can make the most effective uh, recommendations and changes that you, that you need to make. Uh, getting a little bit more technical now, I know I'm on the, on the technical side. Uh, for all you nerds out there, uh, Pingdom, I'm not sure if you've, if you've heard of this tool, some of you may, but it's similar to uh, Google PageSpeed Insights. We know that with everything going mobile, uh, basically page load time is becoming more and more important. So you want to make sure that your, let's say your landing pages are loading uh, and the user is able to engage, engage with them and not having them having them bounce before they even, they even see the content. So Pingdom is a really cool tool that breaks down uh, basically the, the page by the different resources and how the server is then loading those and rendering those inside of your web browser. So Pingdom, another really, really cool tool to, to utilize for, for page yeah, speed. And on top of that, another website tool, and, and we've been hitting it hard in this webinar, but it really is just an awesome tool, is Hotjar. And you can use Hotjar for, like we showed you with, with recording, uh, you know, how your users are interacting with your pages. Um, but you can also set up heat maps to see how they're scrolling through, how much time they're spending on your page. And it's, and it's so easy to use. Uh, you, all you have to do is set up a pixel in your back end. Uh, and then you can, you can use all of their, and everything is free as well. Uh, and it's just such a great tool um, to really figure out how your, your content is resonating with people. Um, I think that would, that would be the main thing. So definitely check it out. Yeah, one, one last one for you guys, and this relates to that, that chi-squared goodness of fit equation that we showed you earlier. Uh, there's a couple of them out there, but one tool we like, that which we've hyperlinked here, basically just allows you to input your observed and your expected values and, and really just run that pretty automatically without having to do a lot of the nitty-gritty math. Uh, so again, utilize that. Uh, this is probably majorly for, for big data or people that are really concerned with their data having very large variants. Yeah. So that's that's a pretty important one as well. Just and you'll to have all on. these links. Uh, we'll send out the, the slide deck. So um, absolutely, let's let's get into something a little bit maybe less essential and more more sexy. Uh, so we put together kind of five sexier optimization strategies that you may or may not be using. Uh, to me, these are a little bit more cutting edge, and we're going to spend a little bit more time and, and get into the the details of these ones. So I'm going to pass it over to Nick to, yeah. to chat about that. I'll go through the first one. I think this one is is really. Really, uh, you know, it's, it's an extremely useful tactic that can have, uh, you know, really big effect on results 
Um, and, and that is uh, creating sophisticated workflow building um, using segmentation that we mentioned before. Um, and I think the main thing is, is linking campaigns together and linking your content together, you know, making it work for every single scenario, every single type of user in your database, and uh, making sure we're, we're giving them every single chance to, to engage and become a customer. And, and what do I mean by that? I know it's a little bit wordy, but I'm going to go through a, just a, a quick example. Um, say, for example, someone is interacting with a, with a particular campaign. We drop them in. Um, you know, very simple. They get a couple of nurture emails. They get to a consultation page. And they, they're just not ready to, to reach out to you and become a customer. So maybe we trigger a workflow. Uh, we send them a couple of emails, again, uh, about, about events. And, and I'm just... Just using one one example, I know these these types of brand emails can be different from company to company. But we send them a couple of emails about an event, and then maybe they attend an event, and then they become a customer. You know, one one you know one example that could happen. Uh, let's think of another example. Maybe they're not ex they're not uh, interacting with your content too much. They get to that same. Bofu consultation page, and we trigger a different workflow that sends them information about another campaign, and uh, they go all the way through that. They get to the end of the the end of the the funnel as well, and then we trigger another workflow. They receive a couple of emails about blogs that we think we might that they might like, and then they turn into a customer. And there's even more examples. Say say they get to the start of that that next campaign, and 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 then they drop off. So we we trigger a workflow. That, that sends them to another campaign. Maybe they don't like that one as well. We, we create a, a triggered list that starts targeting them with, with some PPC, some retargeting. Um, we bring them back to that first campaign. That one really resonates with them. They get to the end page, and then they become a customer. Maybe we don't even stop there. Uh, you know, th This person has a great relationship with us. They love our content, so we trigger another workflow. They receive a, you know, we send them a couple of, of videos that they might like, and who knows, maybe they become a customer again. So these are, these are just a couple of examples of how this kind of these workflows can be integrated together, and how users can just be constantly, constantly exposed to content that can appeal to them and and can turn them into a customer. Um, so really, just endless possibilities, and something that we're we're really excited about going forward. Yeah, I think I think the takeaway for that is that your campaigns shouldn't shouldn't be siloed. Um, it kind of goes back to that concept of a of an inbound marketing ecosystem or a digital ecosystem, just making sure that people can effectively travel through at, at their leisure and you're gathering data upon them and really being able to deliver them the most relevant and the most unique, you know, beneficial content uh, yeah, that they can that speaks to them. From. That yeah, speaks to them. Absolutely. Uh, let's jump on to another one. So the, we mentioned the Wistia turnstiles. Uh, Wistia has been around. They, they work pretty closely with HubSpot. They have that direct HubSpot integration. Really powerful tool. We're going to show you a quick quick example here on, on the landing page uh, so you can kind of see it in, in action. So I'm going to go ahead and have, have this play. You're not going to hear any vol volume, but what we're doing here, we're trying to build a little bit of suspense. Uh, we're also trying to give them context for what, what, what we're trying to deliver, right? What is the value in what we're talking about? Uh, and, and trying to lead them on, on the edge a little bit, right? You want to get them excited. And then, yep, there we go. You can see that uh, Wistia has this really cool form turnstile functionality, which allows you to really capture that person's information in context of the video and even maybe watch the end of the video. So uh, there's lots of analytics. There's lots of heat mapping, tracking, who's viewing your video, and really being able to find out what is that drop-off point inside of your video. Uh, so you really want to be kind of strategic about how you're launching these videos and make sure that you're also lead genning, right? As we move towards that video market, as video becomes more and more important to marketing, uh, making sure that you're leveraging that, you know, in just a general way, but more specifically to, to make sure you're getting some lead generation activities out of that as well. Yeah, this is the bomb. Speaking on, on video, I also wanted to bring up another great tool that we've been using a lot recently, and that is using Facebook Facebook Ads Manager to retarget people that are watching your video. I think it opens a lot of different doors. Uh, you can basically now go after people who are who you know that you can you can guarantee have watched your videos. And this is something extremely valuable when, for example, you're trying to nurture people down a funnel. You know, 
we can make sure that they've they've watched a, a particular piece of content. Let me show. I'm going to give you a quick how to how to do this. Not everybody knows. Um, you open up your ads your ads manager. You go over to the side tab and you select audiences. Once you're there, you hit create audience. Scroll down to custom audience. Then down to engagement on Facebook. Select video. And then here you can see engagement. Choose content type. So I like to choose people who have watched 50% uh, of your video. You know, hopefully you've packed a lot of the, the valuable information in the first half of it. So we're going to select that one. And then we can go on to choose the videos that we want to we want to retarget. And you can see that you know there's quite a few people visit, uh, viewing these. And um, you know, maybe I select this video and then I I, I send the, I target those people with uh, some some content that might that might resonate with them. Quick click confirm and and, and then we have our, our audience already in set. Um, so that's a very powerful tool. Um, and, and like I said, opens a lot of doors and a lot of possibilities, at least at least in my mind. So sure. definitely recommend it. Just off of that, another retargeting tool uh, that we that we use a lot here is a, is Perfect Audience, and mainly we use it because it has the integration with with HubSpot. And I mentioned uh, segmenting in HubSpot before using lists and workflows, um, but once you integrate HubSpot with Perfect Audience, you can actually target those lists. And I'll show you what I mean. We'll pull up Perfect Audience um, already automatically. It starts segmenting people that have viewed your your different website pages, um, and so now I can start going after, for example, people that have viewed our B two B tech page page and or our education page with content that again can resonate with them and might turn them um, into a customer. So, really powerful tool. Definitely recommend um, getting in there and and, and taking a look. Good stuff. The la last thing we want to share with you guys, and you know, I think this is where the, the entire landscape's kind of going, and that kind of stems from the idea that nobody really wants just a flat ebook anymore. Um, so we're trying to come up with a little bit more creative ways to get interactivity, not just make it about the bells and whistles. Uh, as we don't, you know, we, we're not going to just do things for the sake of doing them. Uh, we want to make sure they're adding value or adding context. So we we put together a quick quick example that we'd like to share with you guys uh, in, in the, the context of of basically uh, interactive design. And one, one thing I'll mention is that Adobe recently came out with some new uh, functionality as part of their design suite that allows you to do these things a little bit more effectively on an actual web page, which can tie into some of these campaigns. Uh, so it's something that we're really trying to push the envelope on. You can kind of see here we're, we're getting a little bit of uh, uniqueness on the cover, kind of catching your eye a bit with that, that funnel funnel action going on. And then if you go to the next page, you can see the, the content's being parsed out a little bit. You're, you're able to deliver content sequentially, so they're focusing on the right thing. And even down to interactivity, right? So if we go over and we actually click uh, that little icon right there, we can have a supplementary stat that can give you some context as to what we're talking about. So it kind of adds levels of complexity, of diversity, and really allows you to give a little bit more interactivity with specific pieces other than just delivering a, a flat ebook or a white paper. Um, you know, everything's kind of going to that interactive direction. So that's something we're really pushing the envelope on as well. All right. So we're getting we're getting close here. Um, there's a few things that, that we've covered and we want to make sure that they all make sense to you guys and that uh, you got kind of what you came for. So the first thing you came here for was to learn about some of these cutting edge strategies. Uh, to analyze and push your campaign to the next level. So hopefully you, you got some of those from the from the tools that we shared with you. Uh, second, to really get a great organizational tool, namely that campaign optimization checklist for identifying the pieces of your campaign that need optimization. We'll, we'll send that over to you directly after the webinar. Uh, three, Nick walked us through a really powerful case example in the context of optimization, really got some good value from that. And then finally, uh, giving you early access to an exclusive practical handbook of proven optimization tips namely campaign, the campaign optimization handbook, uh, which we'll be delivering to you guys in about two weeks time here. So to do now, uh, as we kind of go, we got a, a few questions in. So I'm gonna go see if I can, I can gather those. Uh, and if you guys have any more questions, feel free to just to ping it in the chat on, my, on that side panel. Um, but I think, it's, I think it's really important uh, to kind of have more of this, this workshop style. 
So I guess the the first question uh, with all this is is where do you really start, Nick? When you, when we launch a campaign, the campaign's running. What's what's the first step? What do you need to do to organize yourself to start making some of these recommendations and trying to to build upon things, uh, you know, a little bit more effectively than just kind of going carte blanche? Yeah, I mean, I I think the the first thing is, is organization. You know. In a particular marketing team, you can have a lot of different people working on a single campaign, you know, a lot of different eyes, a lot of people changing different things and, and working on different pieces. And the, the crucial thing is to get organized first, take it really take a step back and see your campaign from a, you know, from a top down level. And, and from there, start whittling out the pieces that are, are, are working, the pieces that aren't. Um, and I think, yeah, that's that's one main thing that a lot of people don't do is is uh, focus on the things that are working. You know, sure. instead of fo you know uh, putting all the emphasis on the on the bad pieces of the campaign, you know, takes take some points away from the things that are working. Um, you know, there's a reason for <laughs> there's a reason why they're working. And in the whole the grand scheme of things, you can start taking some good points away from those and applying them to the bad things and, and making everything work in unison. But yeah, like I said, I think organization and, and taking a step back is is that first that first tool that that should definitely um, that should definitely be used. Uh, another question we've got. Um, yeah, and actually, I'll, I'll put this one to, to Sean. Uh, it's about that chi squared. Um, formula that I mentioned that uh, that we mentioned earlier, and we didn't have time to touch on it. Um, but I guess this is the perfect time. The question is, uh, how does uh, how does that chi squared uh, formula let you know um, how variance is is affecting your your data? I'll we'll put that one to Sean. Yes, yeah, so that's that's an important one, right? A lot a lot of times people kind of go in and they and they're just they have a benchmark, and is it outperforming or underperforming on the benchmark? And that's that's not always the the right way from a from a pure statistical format to really look at things, uh, you know, you, you do want to gather as much data as, as you possibly can, um, and you want to make sure that it's statistically relevant, right? If it's not statistically significant, then it, it you know it it's, it can or can can't be the right choice. So basically, what that chi squared formula does is it compares your observed values to your expected values, tries to find out which one is a uh, is basically outperforming right is your is your observed outperforming your expected is your expected outperforming your observed and then you you get that output in a, in a p value format and then you control that uh, I'm sorry you compare that to to another another value as well so to me if you if you're a larger company if you're working with large data uh, you should be trying to control uh, that variance as much as possible um, but you know for me it's it's if you have nothing else to go off of just comparing it to the benchmark is an effective way for a smaller company or a one or two person shop to start to, to start to do that uh, so yeah no I think that covers the the chi squared we, we, have, we have time for one more one more question here I want to stick to our stick to our times uh, so within the the context of, of YouTube can you talk a little bit more about the Facebook video retargeting and, and how that works yeah, that's a good question, uh, and that's something that I've been I've been uh, experimenting a lot with recently is is um, using YouTube um, as an initial platform to to uh, capture users and and pixel them and and start retargeting them. Um, and I've always found that that Facebook is a really really powerful retargeting tool. And if there was some sort of integration that worked between YouTube and Facebook, then that would be that would be awesome. And I did figure out a way to do it. It's a little bit complicated, but you can basically set up a a um, Google AdWords uh, retargeting system on your YouTube views and then start using Google AdWords to advertise only on Facebook. So that's one way around um, that integration between YouTube and, and Facebook. It's very indirect, and I hope, hopefully they're, they're coming up with something new, newer in the future. Good stuff. All right, so I guess that's all the time we have for today for questions. Uh, basically, if, if you have any more questions, uh, we're on LinkedIn, we're on Twitter. Uh, feel free to, to ping either Nick or myself, direct message us, or just put us in a tweet. Uh, we'd be more than happy to connect with you guys and or answer any, any of the follow-up questions that you have. As we mentioned, uh, please stay tuned for the exclusive access to the, the handbook, which will be coming out in about two weeks' time. So keep an eye on your inbox. 
uh, and it has all these optimization tips that Nick was kind of going through and and a lot more. So so keep an eye out for that. Uh, but yeah, that should be about yeah. about it. Yeah, great. Uh, so <laughs> I guess we covered a lot of information. So everyone, stand up, stretch. You know, give yourself a a pat on the back uh, because that concludes our our webinar. And hopefully you're you know you're now ready to to optimize your campaign. Yeah, that's what we hope. Uh, we want to keep you know obviously providing you with some really cutting edge information and uh, a great experience. And and because of that, you know your your feedback is is really important to us. So if you can go ahead and and take that uh, the short five minute survey that we're putting into the chat now, while you know all of this information is is fresh in your head. One more thing. Uh, if you are local to San Diego, you know, you first of all, you're always welcome to to stop by campaign creators and say hello. But we'd also love to uh, invite you to the next SD Inbound HubSpot user group event. Uh, it's a little bit ways away, but it's going to be happening Thursday, April 11th. And uh, if, if you can't make that one, keep an eye on the, the events page for other seminars and webinars happening uh, throughout the year. Um, I think that's it. My name is Nick, and it's it's been a pleasure. Thanks so much for 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 stopping by. Thanks, guys. Appreciate See you it. soon.